Thank you very much. If I'm dancing around, it's to try to stay out of the way of that projector, which is a really wonderfully strong light. Um, lovely to see you all here. Um, I'm going to be talking about the AS67 and why it exists and what it achieves um, in a fairly general sense. Um, the reason why is if you want all the tiny details, it's in the standard. That's the whole point. Um, now it, it occurred to me that when I was preparing for this that exactly 25 years ago, um, I was working for this company and I left to join SSL to do product management. Uh, but from 2001, I've been the AES standards manager um, whose job mainly consists of reading the English of engineers and putting it into better English. <laughs> um, that's my main claim to fame. Um, another lesser claim to fame is that in the year 2000, I was chair of an AES UK conference at Church House in Westminster on moving audio. Uh, the whole point of that was to look at networks to, for moving audio streams and to see where we were and where we were headed. And it was quite interesting because at, the, at that time, a lot of the technology wasn't very firmly fixed. And so you could see people searching in different directions to try and find which way to go. Um, and the, the reason that we're here is, of course, the publication of AS67 um, just 18 months ago. Coming on to that. What is this all about? We're talking about network audio streams. By that I mean um, a network cable acting much as a microphone cable or a line level cable would have done once upon a time. We're talking about production grade audio. We're talking about um, linear PCM, 48 kilohertz or better, 24 bits or better, something you can work with in a production environment and not feel embarrassed by the result. Um, mono or multiple channels, we have to cope with them all. We're not talking about voice over IP or music streaming or Skype or any of that stuff. That's all been done and we all know how good that is. <laughs> now, really, there are two audiences that need to hear this stuff. Um, one is the traditional AES membership, which is audio engineers. And the message here is your infrastructure is no longer yours. It's all being handled by other people now. They're IT type people, and you need to speak to them, and you need to speak clearly about what it is that you need. Um, and that's going to be slightly harder than you ever imagined. Um, and the other thing is for IT engineers. Your clients will have expectations that you never thought about. Um, it's not just routine commercial IT. It's going to be harder than you ever imagined. Um, in the future, there will be engineers that are audio capable, audio intelligent, and IT intelligent and um, I believe the future will belong to them. Right, conventional digital audio. We've skipped analog. <laughs> um, digital audio really came into its own when it was being handled on regular computers with audio interfaces. Hard disk storage for recording and playback. Um, uh, and using bus systems of one sort or another for connections, usually quite short connections. Limited physical size, limited capabilities, but it sort of works and it's fine and we've been using it for years. Um, when we go into streams, digital production grade streams, really that doesn't cut it. And so we've still stuck with, for, for longer cables, dedicated cables using AS3 or MADI or any of the other near-synchronous systems uh, around. Um, now, the good bit about that is you can use regular XLRs, and they're rugged, and you know how to use them. The bad bit about it is that they're regular XLRs, and the wire is massive. This is a shot 
um, at an installation in West 66th Street in New York. It's ABC television. And AS member John Schmidt standing amongst all the cable that he specified. Um, each one of those cables carries one stream. The tonnage of cable that went into that building is unbelievable. It all works, but now it's installed, you can't really change it. You've made a studio installation and you're now going to have to live with that until you rip it all out again. Or in the case of most broadcast studios, you put another layer of wire on top. So why networking? This should now be obvious. The people who are looking to install networks are looking to get the same benefits that um, office structures had when they put in commercial IT. Instead of dedicated um, systems and subsystems, they're expecting to put in something that's a shared resource, it's generalized, it's not specific, uh, it's simple and quick to install. How long does it take to put in an RJ45 connector compared with soldering an XLR? You, you all know the answer to that. Um, and it's simple and quick to adapt when the business model changes. I'm assuming that all audio in this context is part of a business model. Now, that's fine. And the installations for file exchange and for um, all of the um, control data and automation data uh, has never really been a problem. But when it comes to audio streams, it's not that tidy. Um, to be competent, and competent is a good word here, uh, your network needs to be transparent to audio under real operating conditions. Not just on a good day, not just on a Sunday morning, it uh, just needs to work. The audio delays, and there are always delays, need to be manageable. Um, once upon a time, this was in the realms of fantasy. Uh, since then, technology has improved. Moore's law has helped a lot. And we're now talking about it as something that already exists. We've had audio over networks of more or less sophisticated sort for 10 years now. And, and it works fine. And people are installing networks in very large quantities. In broadcast installations, in sports installations, in hotels, in airports, all that kind of thing, where you do not want to be running um, a screen pair cable. Um, now, it's, it's going to be very hard to talk about networks without talking about layers, so I hope you're up for this. Um, <laughs> Bye, Roger. <laughs> You will know from um, long evenings spent in Wikipedia that uh, networks subdivide themselves into layers which are um, mutually orthogonal. You can do things in one layer that, uh, that are independent of what you do in another layer in a perfect world. And these are the physical layer, that's the wire, uh, the data link, those are the bits, the network, transport, session, presentation, and application are all increasing layers of sophistication as you packetize and address and connect and transport packets of data from one place to another place. And this is what your IT person will talk about quite a lot, if you let him. It's usually him. Um, there are four layers on top which I think are very important. And these are the layers that we're responsible for as audio engineers. Before, uh, and it comprises the payload. What's the point of a network unless there's a payload? The audio payload has layers. Um, working, f working from the bottom upwards, there's a codec. If you're going to put um, 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 a codec, perhaps a data compression codec, perhaps some other kind of codec, that's fairly close to the network transport structure. Um, then you have conversion. Uh, convert from an analog audio signal into a digital 
electrical signal. That's where you freeze the quality of what you're doing into uh, something you can ship. There's microphones and loudspeakers, with the, which is the electroacoustic layer. That's sort of separate. And I've got a layer at the top, which I think is really important, which is where you communicate the performance to an audience. And that's the thing that gives all the other layers their value. It's the value layer. If you get that wrong, the rest of it's pointless. Nobody's going to get paid. Um, but that's fine. We're responsible. We're audio engineers. We've been doing that for years. We know how to provide the value, provided the rest of it works as expected. Right. We're talking about choices, so let's see where the choices start. Um, the early <coughs> networks, certainly the early networks that I ever worked with, were not really very useful. Um, 10 base 2 networks, not really very useful, apart from some file exchange. But they got better. But telecoms, the people who do your telephones and provide your broadband, already in the 90s were providing very high-speed interfaces if you knew to ask them properly. And they had protocols like ISDN, which started small but got quite big, uh, Sonnet, uh, Synchronous Digital Hierarchy, FDDI, and ATM were all protocols for transporting data in at very high speeds over specialized cable networks. And in the 90s, a number of us thought that this is where the solution for audio networking was going to come. It was going to be some kind of telecoms-based system, and it was probably going to be ATM. <coughs> and many of us will remember the standard AES-47 that was published in 2002 that standardized professional audio over ATM. Only to discover that... Um, instead, the IT people took over telecoms. And instead of um, IT people using ATM, the telecoms people were now going to use Ethernet. And they would quite like a, um, a connectionless, packet-orientated network system for everything, now including voice calls. As a result of this, Ethernet and TCP IP were standardized. Equipment became widely available in large quantities. It was cheap. People knew how to work it. It's an easy choice, except that it still didn't work very well for audio. But that was the clear pointer to the future. Um, Now, the other part of this is that um, there wasn't just one contender for an IT network. There were lots. Um, lots of proprietary systems put out by companies that specialized in proprietary systems, like IBM and VAX and people like that, DEC. Um, and they didn't talk to each other, and so they grew slowly. But with the standardization of um, Ethernet and TCP IP, things grew much faster because you could connect things together from different manufacturers. And this is a huge part of why standards are not only a good idea, from my proprietary point of view, um, it's really necessary. Um, so, who's responsible for the standards? Well, it's not, it's not just us. Um, there are some quite big players. In, uh, based in Geneva, we have the ISO and IEC. Um, we have the International Telecommunications Union, also based in Geneva, um, writing the big international standards. The IT industry is producing standards at a fantastic rate. The IEEE in the States 
The Internet Engineering Task Force uh, started very quietly and is now a huge force. And the World Wide Web Consortium. Specifically for media, there's the AES, and we look after audio. And there's the SMPTE, and they look after video. And we try and work as closely as possible so that what they do and what we do cooperates. Because the idea of having picture and sound failing to cooperate is just too horrible to imagine. And it happens all the time. <laughs> OK. Um, I'm going to rattle through this next bit quite fast, because I suspect you know it all. What's a network? Well, I've got four sizes of network just to play with, if only to pin down the terminology. Um, there's a bus, which we spoke of earlier, which is for connecting things quite close together as peripherals into a computer. And I'm thinking in terms of USB, I'm thinking in terms of Firewire, I'm thinking in terms of Thunderbolt on newer Macs. Um, they're fine, but that's not what we're talking about. Local area networks is where you can use something like Ethernet to connect a bunch of nodes together within a finite area and have them talk to each other freely. And that's what you'd find in an office or a studio. Campus area networks are multiple local area networks connected by a backbone. It also uses Ethernet, but they're connected by switches to separate out the different pieces. And they can get quite large. But if you want to get really large, you have to give your data to the telecoms companies. And we'll now talk about wide area networking and now the uh, signal that's carried on the cables is no longer just the data that you are familiar with from Ethernet. It's all being properly modulated to get to the other end of a long wire or a long fibre. What about the audio? Well, waveform quality is not an issue. That's already been pretty much fixed at the point that you make the conversion and hopefully you haven't destroyed it too badly by any codec work that you've done. So provided you could ship those bits from one place to another place and play them out at the same sampling frequency, uh, your waveform should be beautifully intact and you should be happy. Um, and pretty much that's what happens. But timing quality is an issue because the timing is the thing that once upon a time we didn't have to think about, but now we really do. Um, there's enough grey hair in the room, I can say this without any fear, that once upon a time we didn't have to think about delays because there wasn't any. It was analogue. You put it in a wire and it came out at the other end of the wire at the same instant. It was lovely. There was no storage. You couldn't afford storage. <laughs> so, they, were called, they were called a kilometre cable. Well, we know that telephone companies had to worry about this, but us regular Joes didn't. Um, however, all digital audio systems introduce delay. All of them. Um, and again, we've been working with this for 20 years. Uh, success. You need to understand it and you need to manage it. You can't ignore it. How much delay are we talking about? Well, a typical digital to digital connection, because of a prudent need to resynchronize, you drop a sample, you lose a sample of time, typically. Digital conversion with oversampling converters, you are looking at 40 samples of delay in the converter, give or take, which is about a millisecond, give or take. If you're prepared to stand up for a greater ripple in the passband, you can make that slightly shorter. If you want a beautifully smooth ripple-free passband, it's probably going to be a bit larger, but it's about a millisecond. Sampling frequency conversion, which tends to appear in block diagrams as a transparent blob, is another 40 samples because you're having to 
break it down and build it back up again to resample the signal. Data compression codecs can be huge. And we're talking uh, two is the best, two milliseconds is the best that I know of. Uh, and that's used sometimes for broadcast contributions. But up to 200 milliseconds for very high efficiency codecs where you're trying to save um, um, bandwidth um, at, at the expense of extra delay. Uh, the sort of compression codecs used for music playout tend to use very high efficiency codecs. But in that, in that particular case, you're not bothered because you don't hear that first 200 milliseconds anyway. So it's not a synchronization problem as such. But you wouldn't want to use that on a live show. Networks add more. Of course. All right. First of all, you have to put the data into packets. And it takes time to put the samples into the packet. And if you have a small packet, you can do it quickly. And if you have a large packet, it takes a bit longer. Um, however, larger packets, because it's the same overhead for addressing, are more efficient. So do you want it now, or do you want it more efficiency later? Well, there are lots of answers to this question. Uh, typically, network systems have packet times of between 125 microseconds right the way up to four milliseconds. Typically, one millisecond. It's a manageable number. It would be nice to think that when you send a packet from the transmitter, it would make its way by the fastest possible route to the receiver in an orderly fashion to be followed by uh, all of the next packets in the same time. I have to tell you, this is not always the case. Uh, depending on the traffic, the rest of the traffic on the network, some packets get there faster than other packets. Um, now, the fact that some of the transparent layers in, in the network um, uh, layer model glue them back together in the right order is remarkable, and it's a really good thing. But the time it takes for the worst case packet to get to the receiver is of interest here because that's setting the worst case delay. Um, in order to smooth it out, you need a buffer at the receiver to, to take in packets as they arrive, to compensate for the worst case packet jitter and provide smooth flowing audio output at the other end. That buffer time is significant. If you've got a more jittery network, you need a bigger buffer. That's more delay. Um, I did mention multi-channel streams. Um, although we're going to be listening uh, um, to object-based playback later this evening, I understand. Uh, a lot of multi-channel audio still relies on parallel streams that need to remain in phase synchrony in order to hold up the psychoacoustic model. Um, and if you separate the different parts of a multi-channel stream that's required to do this, um, bad things can happen. Um, quite bad if your left channel suddenly turns up a millisecond or two after your right channel. So that's not good. So you either have to keep related streams together as a bundle or use really high quality timing at the playout. In fact, you need that anyway. And the high quality timing is the biggest clue to how this is going to work. Let's look at media clocks. In the video world, um, they solved this decades ago by distributing sync pulses. And when we introduced AES-3 in the 1980s, we did the same thing by um, sending around AES-11 audio sync pulses so that everything clocks to the same reference. Everything is in the same phase and has the same frequency. 
if you tried to do that with a network, what would happen is you would have the wonderfully efficient cabling for the audio data, plus the whole jumble of fixed point-to-point -point cabling for the reference, which would be silly. Um, and that's not what is being proposed. It's proposed instead to distribute a precision time protocol. That is where you send out time information over the network so that each point on the network knows exactly what the time is to the nanosecond. I'd like to say this was invented for audio people, but it really wasn't. But we're going to use it. Um, the document that I recommend you read is IEEE 1588 2008 Precision Time Protocol. And it's, it makes you think in quite a different way about how things happen. Um, there is a grandmaster clock connected to the, to the network. It, the time information is distributed all over the network in a way that everybody knows exactly what the offsets are on, on each leg of the network. And it controls media clocks in each device. So each device generates master sync internally, that is, in sample phase with all the other devices connected to the network. And that's a very, very cool idea. Because suddenly it means you've broken free of that distributed sync pulse system. And you can now concentrate on doing audio here or here or here. And the network will handle the timing. Now, it was at the point that this became available that in the AS standards community we thought, ah, there might be a way of doing something really interesting here. And so shortly after 2008, we set up a project to look at it. And we set up a project called romantically called, I think, <coughs> AESX192, um, with the scope to provide not just a standard, not particularly a standard for moving audio over networks, because that had already been done, that has been done, but to make it interoperable, so that when a manufacturer A plugs a patch cord into a box from manufacturer B, audio will flow. And we defined it up front as being, we need, it needs to be linear PCM, frequency, sampling frequency of 44.1 or better. Frankly, we couldn't think of anybody using 44.1 in a network, but some American radio stations corrected us on that. 16 bits or higher, most people are using 24. Low latency. Um, our original scope said 10 milliseconds or less. In fact, we ended up with one millisecond as the thing to go for. Um, and a number of people sat around a number of tables to discuss this. Um, here, here we are in Budapest working on the problem. Um, in the far left, you can see Kevin Gross, who was the task group leader, who made it his job to pull together the specification. And he did a, a really good job. And the first rule of X192 is no making stuff up. <laughs> this was really quite important and it set the, set the tone for everything else that we did, which is you could sit around a table with your mates thinking, how would it be if um, this technology were to exist. And you could have a little fantasy about that. How would it be if we did that? Not the point. The standard was for interoperability. It's to take things that already existed and specify which of them we should use and with what parameters. And that clarified the situation enormously. We can actually make some headway now. Um, to the extent that in 18 months later, uh, 18 months after the Budapest meeting in New York, we'd finished the job. And here we are. This is the, the group responsible with um, Kevin looking justifiably pleased in the front. Um, Richard Foss, who's the chair of the working group, 
looking even more pleased, and the people who wrote it standing around. Um, and it, it was a big deal. It still is a big deal. Let me explain what it standardises. The payload. <coughs> It shall be L24 or L16. This is existing codecs for linear PCM uh, that are covered by IETF RFCs. I'm not going to list them now. Um, I am going to duck back and say they are already listed in here. And I'm going to make a, a sidebar pitch to say that, of course, as members of the AES, you get these free as a benefit of membership. So you can download these. The standard covers sampling frequencies of 48 kilohertz, 96 kilohertz, or 44.1 kilohertz, uh, with a specific preference for interchange for 48 kilohertz. All compliant devices must be able to do 48 kilohertz. They may do others. You have to be able to handle between one and eight channels. That means any receiver has to be able to receive up to eight channels. Any transmitter may transmit anything between one and eight. You can do more if you like. In terms of network stuff, um, the first decision had to be made fairly briskly. This is designed to work on IP version 4. That's the version of internet protocol that's already out there. It's slowly being replaced by IP version 6, which has a bigger address space. Um, and we've taken care that the standard will stretch to IP version 6 without breaking anything. But right now, it's at IP version 4. The timing and media clocks will use precision time protocol. IEEE 1588. The transport mechanism is real-time protocol over UDP. That's been fixed for a long time. Packet time. There are options for 125 microseconds up to 4 milliseconds. Um, however, everything must be able to handle the 1 millisecond packet time. So that's like the plain vanilla of interchange is one millisecond packet time. Connections. Um, we're using multicast quite a lot for this in that uh, you can have one transmitter setting up a multicast and then different devices can then subscribe to that stream and pick it up rather than making individual connections each time. You can do that using unicast, but Specifically in the case of audio distribution, that seems to be a special case rather than the other way around. Um, we have recommendations for quality of service. Quite specific recommendations. The data that needs the highest priority and is the best protected is the clock data. Then comes the audio data and then comes all the management data for setting up um, circuits and uh, setting up um, connections. And that's basically it. There's a lot more in detail. Um, and I recommend you read it. The documents, although I say it myself, is really good. Now, this is all very well. But does it work? Always the awkward bit. Does it work? Um, we set up, in order to answer this question, we set up what we call a plug fest so that manufacturers could get together and plug their equipment together in a politically neutral environment just to see if it worked. This was for the engineers, not for the marketing people. And we did that last October. And we did it at the Institute for Rundfunktechnik in Munich, which is um, 
um, the research department for most of Northern Europe these days. Um, we did it in conjunction with the EBU, who were very keen to see this work. And through the EBU, we had technical support and equipment and people from the IRT, from Swedish Radio and the BBC coming to help us. It was really good. <coughs> um, let me show you what it looks like. It looks like exactly what you'd imagine. <laughs> There's a, there's a table in the middle. Uh, the big black box there has the master clock in it. Uh, the smaller blue box is a switch, a regular TCIP switch, TCP IP switch. And all around the outside are people with um, bits of equipment connected to it um, just to check that we, everybody can send and receive. And it was huge fun, in a slow motion kind of a way. Um, let's see this. We had 10 companies participated, 16 products were tested, and we started off by seeing if everybody could, meet, uh, could sync. Can everybody sync? That took 10 minutes. Everybody said, yeah. And we thought, how are we going to spend the rest of the three days? <laughs> um, and then we started the, the steady pro process of working through um, nominating each product in turn as being the transmission master and everybody else picking up the multicast distribution to confirm that they were getting correct data the audio waveforms were all good and hadn't been mashed on the way. Um, and <coughs> there, were, there were no dropouts and the timing was all correct. And that would take about half an hour for each one. So right there, we, we spent another day. <coughs> and that went really well. Um, while the manufacturers were getting on with that, at uh, the other end of the room, um, the two guys on the left are from Swedish radio and they're looking after the audio. The um, uh, audio precision kit here is giving them information about um, any distortion in the waveform, any packet loss will show up as, a, um, as components in a, a distortion trace. In the foreground we see Peter from the BBC looking at the um, using Wireshark to look at the traffic protocol to make sure that the, um, the traffic is announcing itself as it should and that it's flowing through as it should. And the, in the middle of it all, oops, was Kevin, who was sort of like um, a, a conductor, making sure everything happened on time. <coughs> this went really well. We didn't have perfect success, but we did have 97% success. It was interesting the things that tripped people up, and it was little things like um, configuration files. Do you put a full stop at the end? No. <laughs> Um, if you put a full stop at the end, does it break everybody's systems? No, but it does some. Um, stupid stuff, basically. But because everybody was in the room together, everybody was able to work away and solve the problems um, in, a as I say, a politically neutral way, um, the atmosphere was really good. People genuinely collaborated on finding problems finding solutions to problems and, uh, and implementing them on the spot. It was really good. We are planning to repeat this again in North America sometime this spring. Details yet to be advised, but we shall see. Um, oh. I should brandish this at you. I know this looks just like the last one I held up, but it's different. Um, there is a report 
also free to AES members called ASR12. I know you don't particularly want questions right now, but who was involved in your plug fest manufacturer wise, or aren't you going to tell us? I'm not going to tell you. Oh, no, yes, I am. Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> In the report, which you can download and read, has all the um, he said, she said detail in it. Um, I can tell you that the manufacturers involved are, because I was able to talk about this, ALC Networks, Archwave, Axia Audio, Digigram, Direct Out, uh, Georg Neumann, Lavo, Merging Technologies, Sound4 and Telos Systems from the States. So it was all revenge. Um, a lot of it was uh, Ravenna-based originally, yes. Yes. Um, the report was written under, Chatham House, under the Chatham House rule, which says you can't point fingers. So you'll find the engineering information, but you won't see blame attached. <laughs> Not that you were looking for that, anyway. Um... So where does this take us? Very close to the end here. In the future, I firmly believe that a lot of audio infrastructure will be IT based. Not all of it, a lot of it in, in standalone studios is probably most sensibly kept to the existing synchronous um, systems. There is a strong argument for using AS3 and MADI where it makes sense. As soon as it stops making sense, as soon as you have to send signals to uh, a much wider range of places, then you have to start thinking about networks and the time management that goes on top of that. I mentioned before that audio engineers no longer have direct control of their working environment, and that's sort of true. Um, and it will be especially true if audio engineers don't pay attention and get uh, and get involved. You will need to have constructive engagement with your IT providers and your IT support staff. You should probably get to know them now if you haven't already. You should probably learn about this stuff yourself because people who understand the IT, all of those layers of the network model are going to be in a much stronger position in the future starting now. Conversely, IT engineers will need to handle all media types. Um, we can make ourselves a nuisance and tell them about the audio, but we know that just down the road, there's another bunch of people going to tell them about the video. And that's a different set of um, requirements and criteria, some of which will be the same, some of which will be special and different. Um, on that point, it is the case that SMPTE are driving fit to bust uh, to standardise technology for um, an IT-based production environment for television, video and audio. So this is not um, entirely abstract. Work is going on right now. And I'm going to bring you back to this, because this, this sort of makes the point, which is audio people are going to need to understand this stuff. It's actually quite important. It's not difficult. It's, uh, there's a lot of it, but it's not difficult. And IT people are going to need to understand the importance of those top four layers. If they can get the, top th uh, the next three layers right, then the one at the top, the value layer, should be really straightforward. But until all of that comes together, it's going to be difficult. Right, in summary, there's quite a lot of pressure to simplify technical installations. The new broadcasting house is a wonderful case in point where a building full of wire was transformed into a building with much less wire doing more stuff. I think that's fair to say. The success depends on who's specifying the system. 
If you get your IT people to put it together, you have only yourselves to blame. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever we say now, networks are going to get bigger and more complex. Uh, so you need to be ready for that. This is, shouldn't come as a surprise. In 10 years' time, it's all going to be bigger and much more complex. And straightforward IP network implementations that we understand now, that will evolve too, because those standards don't stand still. Everything moves forwards. Um, and we'll be looking at, um, looking for solutions to problems we had no idea existed in 10 years' time. And there will be new network types. People are working on advanced networks to supersede IP networks. Um, and so, continual competition. And land shall speak under land. <laughs> um, I like to think so. Um, that's me done for now. Uh, thank you very much, and I'm open for questions. Sorry, Mark, I'm going to dive in again. Matt Saunders. Um, you mentioned Sumpty were doing something. Yes. Is that AVB or not really? Um, they haven't got to that point. Um, uh, I don't believe so um, as yet. That, no decision has been made on that. Um, they are looking at how... Um, at the moment, they're looking at how... The, I believe they're looking at how the question should be framed in order to get a sensible answer. Um, I don't think they've grabbed at a technology and said, oh, we'll use this one. Well, They're looking to see what needs to be kept. It doesn't quite answer your question, but um, what they have right now is a, a family called SMPTE SD 2022, uh, which encapsulates HDSDI and some other codecs um, in IP protocols um, and includes also forward error correction uh, for that. And, um, so that's where they've got to. Um, typically, SMPTE 22 uh, 6. Um, is being used by Sony for their F55 cameras um, as the interface between the camera and, and the CCU today. So that's starting to be applied for um, UHD TV um, networks, basically. And just sort of addendum, is everything going to live in perfect harmony on piano keyboards? I mean, is AES67 going to sit with AVB happily and nicely? And is everybody else going to get on board with AES67, we hope? We've had a lot of support for AS67. Um, AS67 and AVB look as if they're trying to do the same thing, but there are differences. AVB is what you would call a layer two protocol. <coughs> layer two. Um, that requires some slightly special switches and, um, and otherwise uh, hand, uh, handles data in that, in that way. AS67 um, is a layer three protocol, so it uses the network routing that you've already got. Um, and that seemed to be quite appealing to a number of people in that you, know, you, have, a, you have a network with routing and um, use the routing. It still needs special switches? Uh, no, it needs competent switches, but it doesn't need 1588 switches, it if that's what you're referring to. But it needs special switches that are yeah, there, are, there are sufficiently low latency to guarantee the latency. Well, it needs competent switches. You can't use... If, yeah, you, if you, you, went, you, you, can't, you can't use off-the-shelf ordinary, ordinary bog-standard switches. You, you, do, you, do, you do need If you went to your local computer switches. store and bought switches off the shelf there, you deserve everything you get. Yeah. yeah but, Which one is but <laughs> It needs to be highly managed. But in order to achieve the latency, you need low-latency switches. I mean, that that's, that's goes without saying, but they're, they're not... Your bog for standard vanilla switches. Yeah, I mean you do you, you do have to choose switches. And then you need someone who actually understands diff so yes. can stick their finger in yes. the right pie. Yes. Sorry, I'll shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mike. Um, I've got two questions. Um, I'll ask either I don't think of the them. microphone's working. Three questions. Um, <laughs> the first one is how does Dante fit in with AS sixty seven? And the second question is what patent problems are there? Um, Dante announced this time last year that it would implement AS67 <laughs> in spring 2015. So I'm watching the space with interest. Um, 
they do claim um, um, that they have a patent that covers some of the content of AS67. I have no idea about the value of the patent, <coughs> but you will find that in the front of the standard, we log their claim. Right. That's all I'll say. Could I, could I expand on that a little bit? Yes. Um, I'm sure this mic is not actually doing anything. Uh, oh, sorry, in that case, I've just flattened all the limiters. Sorry, big sorry, pardon. And you are? Phil Packer, Layer 3 Systems. I've done a lot of work with Mr. Brunn down there, down the front. Um, we um, talked a lot about effectively moving the essence about, um, but one of the more thorny elements of this is going to be um, handling the metadata, the call setup information and such like, which is the big area where Dante and Ravenna are highly divergent. Um, do you see the need for standards work in that area to ensure that we really can plug and play? Something that I skipped in AS67 was set up using SIP protocol. Oh, thank you. So that's in there. Um, th th there's a limit as to how deeply I, I was prepared to go into this document today, because you can read it all. Um, there are lots of other things that aren't in AS67 for instance, um, control and monitoring protocols are not in there. Um, they probably shouldn't be in there as part of a transport standard, but they will be there as part of a control standard. And if you're interested, you should look at AES X210, which is in three parts at the moment, A, B and C, for a framework, a class tree, and a TCP IP implementation thereof. And that's for controlling audio equipment and monitoring audio equipment across a distributed network. Yes. I, do I get a follow-up? Q. Um, <laughs> do you not think that the interop people were given a bit of a free pass by only having a single switch on their network? The, the which people? The, when you did the, um, the plug fest. Yes. Very simple network, mm -hmm. flat switch by the looks of it. Do you think that was a bit of a get out? Because practical networks will be rather more complicated than that. I didn't go into day three, did I? Um, day three, after we'd uh, sorted out all the basic plain vanilla interchange, we did connect additional switches to the system and we did pass um, 24 and 32 channel streams around at 96 kilohertz and did all those other things uh, simultaneously with everybody else doing their own thing to see if anything strained and fell over, and actually it was, it seemed fine. I think I need to read the document, don't I? I think you do. Thank you very much. <laughs> Good point, well made. <laughs> Sean. Thank you. Uh, I'm also old enough, enough grey hairs you mentioned, to remember when, if you wanted to watch the New Year concert from Vienna and have good sound, you could watch it on television and listen on FM radio. Uh, I tried this this year. Now, the, the one millisecond delay that's been mentioned a lot sounds inoffensive enough, unless you're worried about phase response in multi-channel. But um, what I'm not sure about is the uh, relationship between one millisecond and about eight to 12 bars of music in three, four time, because, you know, the orchestra picture and sound are about that number of bars out. Yes. Uh, will this ever be brought into sensible relationship? Um, uh, I'd like to refer to time management above, <laughs> which is you could probably fix it provided you think about it up front. Um, but we all know of examples in current broadcasting where timing, particularly on switching to opt-outs, you end up with missing pieces or interpolated pieces. Um, where the timing is being considered good enough, but you can hear the artefacts. Um, but you're right. Uh, if, if it's wrong, there's no reason for it to be wrong. I believe that the primary reason why these things are wrong is that traditionally we haven't been used to thinking in terms of time management in that sense. We've assumed that it's, it's all going to be okay, possibly with a little error. We haven't said it's going to be wrong. Let's establish what the error is and have it where we want it to be. Print. Not to mention the fact that uh, video projectors have variable delays built into them. 
<laughs> so you're sunk before you start in that respect. Um, I'll come clean. I've spent a, I've been a video engineer since 1984. <laughs> um, you're a brave man, <laughs> sir. I've been an audio engineer, or pretend audio engineer, for the last 10 years, so, um, uh, but I'm not an IT engineer yet. Um, so lip sync, which is what we're really talking about, although you, I think you're talking about bow sync, which is a, <laughs> or, or finger sync, which is a different question. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> and, and also a different question, which is um, television to radio trans, uh, differential delay, particularly between digital and analog transmission systems is, well, just going back to lip sync uh, in, in, in television. So video delay is really complicated topic, unfortunately. Um, it varies with your camera shutter speed. It varies with your camera um, frame rate. Um, every time you go through a, a DV box to have a little squeeze zoom or something in there, that potentially adds another frame in, in some vision mixers. Um, every time you go through a video synchronizer, um, you can have a, a varying drop of a, a one frame or, or, or not. And the, the actual time delay through that thing is continually drifting um, because realistically you can't lock Austria to the UK. It's not going to happen. Even in the world of the Euro, it's, you, this, this is not going to happen. <laughs> um, similarly, you can't lock Australia to Thailand, to UK, to, to Germany. So when the World Cup came out of Brazil, it goes into the Eurovision Network backbone. There are three satellites. There's a you know, gigantic fiber ring going around the world. There's 150 data nodes. There's over 1,000 different um, um, professional encoders and decoders in the network. It isn't going to happen. So there are always ha clock hand handover points. And therefore, you have variable timing latencies all the way through these systems. Um, it gets to the point where at higher frame rates, lip sync is, is, is more more visible because you've got a finer, finer time resolution. So psychovisually, there's a whole raft of things there. The broadcast specification is that the audio shall not lead the video by one frame, more than one frame, and shall not lag by more than two television frames. And a TV frame is 40 milliseconds. So it's minus 40 to plus one, or plus, plus 80. That's the total, including the receiver, includes the, as you say, the, um, the deinterlacing buffer delay in your television, um, the, the delay in a multi-viewer in a uh, broadcast plant is usually one frame per image. So if, you, if you've got eight images on there, it could have, eight, could have eight frames of delay, depending on how it's built. So the, the poor sound guy has got all these things to try and work out in, 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 their, in their booth. Um, you've got all the vision mixer processing delay, which is completely separate to the audio paths. So the, the, the practicalities of getting this working in, in mixed digital systems, this helps but it doesn't actually fix the core problem, which actually is all these different buffer delays through, through the system and the differences between them, which are there for some very, very good reasons. Uh, and getting video and audio buffing delays to track in real world broadcast systems um, is, um, is, is an art as well in order to, to get those two, those two things to, to track and, and, and do not give a differential between the two. So there's, there's loads of reasons why it goes wrong and it still remains today an extremely complicated problem. So. Can I come back on that? <laughs> Um, Prin's absolutely right. <laughs> um, lip sync has been a, 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 a difficult problem for 30 years. And in systems that rely on sync pulse distribution to lock sound and picture together, you do get exactly the situation that Prin spoke about, and it's what's currently installed, and it's a nightmare. Um, taking you back to IEEE 1588, Precision Time Protocol, um, it's a new tool. It has a possibility that I think requires a good deal of hard thought, and I've already um, <coughs> suggested it in a number of quarters which is if you could determine the playout time of any media stream, you could make those two synchronous regardless of the arbitrary paths that those streams took to get there. You can play out multi-channel audio such that it's all phase coherent even though all five or eight channels were coming through separate paths. You could have video play out in perfect lip sync with an audio stream or a bundle of audio streams 
regardless of the path taken to get there. The engineering necessary to achieve that is simply not there at the moment. And if you're reliant on the sync pulse distribution, you could not achieve that anyway. You can't get there from here. But with precision time protocol, actually you can, and it's the sort of goal we should be aiming for, I think. Mike, you had at least two more. No, that's quiet. No, I was just speculating privately that if you time aligned everything, it, all channels would be plus one hour. <laughs> well, fortunately, if you're talking about a playout time, you just need to agree a time and go for it. And, uh, and you can agree a frequency based on... And you can agree a frequency based on international uh, distributed... Um, frequencies um, you can get from all over the place. Sorry to come back with another one, but um, how silly do the sample rates get in AES 67? 96 kilohertz is the highest we go currently. Right. So anybody who's doing it over and above that, like Swiss people who make boxes that send DSD up Ravenna. That's not linear PCM. Well, okay, okay, DXD then. That is linear PCM. Yeah. Um, <laughs> how, does, how, how will that fit within your... I mean, what will happen if you plug a box onto a network that's doing, hi, I'm doing a silly sample rate? Um, will other boxes go, oh, my God, or will well, something say, happen? We don't, un we don't understand what you're trying to send us. Um, could you speak to my manager and arrange something else? Right. Um, the, the way that uh, links are negotiated in AS67 means that you could conceivably add more frequencies outside the narrow spec. But bear in mind, our spec is designed for interoperability. The whole point is that you plug things together and it works. Anything less is sort of not useful. Um, if you're going to operate at... 500 kilohertz sampling because you can well that's fine but you probably have to make some arrangements to get your data shipped to somewhere else and that's also fine and just one more quick one um at your next plug fest do you anticipate seeing an australian contingent um i'd be very surprised if they weren't there thanks any other questions so you're next. Yeah. Um, yeah. Kind of just going back to the um, the A AVB uh, issue. In a in a real network, um, there's mixed traffic. Um, all kinds of contention. People will be reading their emails. There'll be uh, various things going on. So uh, a, a more realistic test um, that moves into the kind of AVB territory of uh, uh, aggressive priority and routing and things like that. Yep. Has uh, have you uh, made provisions for such things as maybe uh, variable? Uh, are all of the parameters of this negotiable um, dynamically, so we can change uh, frame size or quality of service priorities and things in order to uh, make intelligent dynamic routing decisions? Um, you can make uh, changes if you really want to. Um, the, it's sort of against the spirit of setting up a clean production grade audio link yeah. to have it broken to something that isn't later. Yeah. Um, picking up on your very early point, um, which is uh, handling mixed traffic, one of the decisions you'll need to make, apart from buying a competent switch, as Prin pointed out, is are you really going to allow unfettered traffic on your mission critical media network. The very first project that I've ever tried doing this, that's exactly what happened. We found that we were cohabiting the network with the CCTV cameras. <laughs> <coughs> so um, in, in reality, this, that's what happens. In yeah. reality, that's what happens. Uh, but uh, and there comes a point where actually you probably don't want that to happen. Um, and there are security issues as well. Um, but that's, out, that's outside the scope of the standard. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, the, the AS67 is designed to work with mixed traffic. It assumes that there's going to be email and web browsing going on. Um, if it's connected to the manufacturing computer during stock taking week, you may lose audio. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> Good recommendation. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, over there. Yeah, um, AES 3, part 3, I think it is, and uh, AES 11 both go to a lot of, um, well, go to great lengths to define coping with jitter. Yes. And uh, I suppose the equivalent with networking, once we've got this wonderful uh, PTP connection, um, that break will break down due to packeting jitter. So even with the best... Um, Different jitter, yes. Yeah, d uh, even with the best uh, differential service control, whatever it is, um, correct prioritization, um, once you started transmitting your maximum transmission size email, um, the instant you just want to start transmitting your clock message, the clock message is going to have to wait to the end of the email, presumably. No, the clock gets the highest priority. The highest email priority. gets the lowest, best But if you priority. started transmitting your packet of uh, email, then you can't presumably interrupt a packet once it's already transmitting on Ethernet. Email packets are tiny. Okay, so... About PPTP, is it very, very cunning use of um, phase lock loops at the, um, at the end points? Yes. So that it continually... Um, you can afford to delay some PPTP packets because the phase lock loop keeps it all in, all in sync at the end points. Right, so I suppose the question I'll be getting to actually then is... Um, do you think there's a need eventually for a standard about the face lock loops for PTP? If you're um, under sort of stress situations, I can imagine the clock. It's almost at a point where there's no point in standardising it because it's a quality issue for the manufacturer of that piece of equipment. It's got nothing to do with interchange, but it has a lot to do with the quality of the performance of that equipment uh, to put in the spec sheet. Um, I want to pick up on the general idea of jitter because there are at least two, there's at least four sources of jitter I can think of. Um, the, the sort of jitter we're used to talking about is jitter into converters where the, the data is not going in in a smooth frequency, it's being distorted in time. And that will give you noise problems of one sort or another. Uh, packet jitter at a network is not like that at all, that's simply a time delay. Um, you will still have to deal with um, some jitter inside the box that's taking data out of the buffer and presenting it to the DAC, but that's a fairly small, conventional, manageable technical problem that's been solved over and over again in the last 30 years. Um, picking up on the point earlier, the precision time protocol should give you smooth enough media clock at the point of playout that that should be smooth and continuous and shouldn't be the source of jitter. You should be able to make a nearly perfect clock. Um, and so the audio quality of what comes out should be absolutely fine. If you choose to make it less than absolutely fine, then that's a design choice by you. I don't think we can standardize that. You mentioned security mm -hmm. earlier. Mm -hmm. um, so if I'm going to send valuable and perhaps extraordinarily sensitive audio over a wide area network that's operated by the telcos, I might want some encryption. Yes, you might. Uh, you, I, I, I know AES67 doesn't do that because I downloaded the very good value uh, standard and read it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I would commend that to everybody. But, but are you aware of any work being done on, on that? I'm aware of lots of work being done. Um, it's not the sort of thing that comes to us in standards uh, with people saying you must standardise this encryption for audio streams. I fully expect that to happen at some point in the mid-term. Probably not immediately, but in the mid-term, I would expect to see that happen. I would agree. Okay, well, thanks, Mark. <laughs>